Prepare to step into a world of wonders as we unveil some of the most astonishing treasures and wonderful ancient artifacts ever unearthed. This video is your gateway to the extraordinary. Join us as we delve into the realms of history and marvel at the incredible discoveries that shed light on our fascinating past. Prepare to be amazed by these remarkable glimpses into times long past. If you know which graveyards to look at in Rome, you might find a so-called catacomb saint or two. The strange existence of these bejeweled skeletons is connected to a fraud perpetrated by the Vatican between the 16th and 19th centuries. For reasons that nobody has ever explained, the Vatican ordered the exhumation of several skeletons from graveyards in Rome, dressed the bones up with fine garments and jewels, and had them shipped to Catholic countries around the globe as the supposed physical remains of saints. The skeletons became venerated objects in the countries they arrived in, often adorned with even more gold and jewelry. In some cases, the anonymous bones were even dressed up with crowns and robes like kings and queens. Many of them are now on display in Rome's catacombs, hence their modern-day nickname of catacomb saints. As historical curiosities go, they're some of the strangest religious objects of all time. Although the truth of their non-saintly origin is now known, the skeletons are still extremely valuable because of all the accessories they come with. Several are still held in private collections all over the world. We're heading to Jerusalem now to look at a stunning jewelry collection, one piece of which stands out above all the others. It's a 900-year-old earring, and it was found in the ruins of what's thought to be a crusader tower in the town of Modi'in Maccabim Roit. The tower stands on Titora Hill and is about 20 miles from Jerusalem. Rather than being discovered by a professional archaeologist, this earring was found in June 2017 by a team of 2,500 school children serving as summer volunteers with the Israeli Antiquities Authority. The part of the fortress that the earring was found in is thought to have been the kitchen, so it's easy to imagine a busy cook accidentally dropping their jewelry either into the food or behind a stove, only for it to remain trapped there for nine centuries. Totora Hill is known to have been settled by humans since at least 6,000 years ago, so there's no shortage of ancient artifacts to be found there by archaeologists, school children, or anybody else. Other pieces recovered by the children include bracelets, rings, and hairpins. The site is thought to have been first settled around 6,000 years ago, so there's probably more to find there if people dig deep enough. A May 2023 discovery off the coast of Beit Yanai, Israel, has unveiled a fascinating glimpse into the past through the remains of an ancient shipwreck. The site, dating back 1,800 years to the Roman Empire, has yielded an astonishing trove of rare marble artifacts. The find, believed to be the oldest sea cargo of its kind in the eastern Mediterranean, consists of approximately 44 tons of Roman period marble architectural pieces. These marble blocks, likely sourced from Turkey, were likely destined for a port in the southern Holy Land. Archaeologists are excited by the significance of the discovery, as the marble blocks were potentially intended for the construction of an elaborate public building, possibly a grand temple or a magnificent theater. The sheer size and quality of these architectural elements indicate the grandeur and scale of the intended structure. While similar architectural elements were often made locally and covered in white plaster to imitate marble, these artifacts are genuine marble. Excavations at the site are sent to continue, with a focus on uncovering any remains of the ship itself. This exploration aims to shed more light on the vessel's design, size, and construction techniques as well as offer insights into ancient maritime trade routes and navigation practices. The box brooches of Viking Age Gotland hold great social significance. Situated in the middle of the Baltic Sea, Gotland once served as a strategic Viking trade hub, resulting in an abundance of silver hoards and the importation of prestigious materials. The production process involved a decentralized network of craftsmen who received materials directly from clients. Box brooches were often buried with young girls, marking a transition into adulthood. 
They represented family history and personal identity, passed down as heirlooms or commissioned for special occasions. The brooches were meticulously placed in graves alongside other native Gotlandic jewelry, creating an idealized image of a Gotlandic woman. Individual agency was also evident, with older brooches deliberately taken out of circulation. Outside of Gotland, these brooches found unique contexts, such as their transformation into ritual cups. Ultimately, the box brooches of Viking Age Gotland were more than decorative items. They embodied craftsmanship, exchange, ownership, and cultural expression, symbolizing wealth, connections, and belonging to a distinct island culture. They played a vital role in social life and relationships, reflecting the rich heritage of Viking Age Gotland. The gold diadem of Tutankhamun, a remarkable piece of ancient Egyptian craftsmanship, served the dual purpose of securing the pharaoh's wig during ceremonies and offering symbolic protection to his forehead in the afterlife. This gorgeous diadem features a stunning design with gold cloisons embellished with carnelian circles and edged with turquoise, lapis lazuli, and blue glass inlays. At its center front, the protective deities of Upper and Lower Egypt, Nekbet and Wajet, are represented with intricate details, including obsidian eyes and semi-precious stones. Papyrus flowers made of malachite and chalcedony knot add further elegance to the diadem. Interestingly, the vulture's head and cobra weren't attached to the diadem during the mummification process, suggesting they were placed lower on the body. Discovered on Tutankhamun's mummified head within his tomb when it was opened by Howard Carter in 1922, this diadem is not only a testament to ancient Egyptian artistry, but also provides insights into their beliefs about the afterlife. It stands as a remarkable symbol of Tutankhamun's legacy and the rich cultural heritage of the pharaohs. The Iron Crown of Lombardy, believed to have originally served as an armlet or a votive crown due to its diminutive size, holds a place of utmost reverence as a holy relic in the Cathedral of Monza. Although its earlier use in coronations remains unproven, it gained notable recognition during the crowning of Henry VII as the Holy Roman Emperor in 1312. Crafted from six interlinked plates of gold and reinforced by a narrow iron ring, the Iron Crown of Lombardy showcases exquisite artistry, adorned with precious jewels and delicate translucent enamel, hinting at possible Byzantine origins. Notably, the presence of the Iron Ring wasn't documented in earlier descriptions of the object, so it was potentially added during the 12th century. It wasn't until around 1585 that it was adorned with a nail purportedly used during the crucifixion of Christ. Despite ongoing debates surrounding its authenticity, the Congregation of Relics in Rome authorized the public display of the crown for veneration in 1717. Today, the Iron Crown stands as a revered symbol of Lombard heritage, attracting visitors from far and wide who seek to behold this cherished artifact that carries both historical and religious significance. George Kastroidi Skanderberg an Albanian national hero, rebelled against the Ottoman Empire in Albania during the 15th century. He's a folk hero, but unlike the folk hero Robin Hood in England, we have physical proof of his existence. Among his surviving belongings are a helmet, a prayer book, and two swords. One legend suggests that Skanderberg's sword was so heavy that only he could wield it, while another sword was renowned for its ability to cut through steel and was given to the Ottoman Sultan. The surviving swords include a curved one, used in warfare, and a straight golden sword, potentially influenced by Skanderbeg's Turkish training. Skanderbeg's helmet, made of white metal with a golden horned goat atop, became Albania's national royal crown. The helmet bears inscriptions that translate to Jesus Nazarene blesses thee, Prince of Mat, King of Albania, Terror of the Ottomans, King of Epirus. The history of these belongings is complex, with various owners throughout the centuries. They were reunited for display during Skanderbeg's 500th anniversary in Vienna, before being returned to Albania in 2012 as part of their centennial celebration of independence. 
In November 2013, amateur metal detectorist Lawrence Egerton set out into a field close to his home in Seton Down, Devon, England, with his instrument in his hand. By the time he came home again, he discovered one of the most significant hauls of Roman coins ever discovered in the British Isles. In total, Lawrence recovered 22,888 coins. Further archaeological excavations revealed the presence of a Roman fort and villa nearby, both of which were built in either the 2nd or 3rd century. All of the coins were minted between the years 260 and 348 and are made from copper alloy. Most of them are from the 4th century, dating to the reign of Roman Emperor Constantine I, or the subsequent joint reign of Constantinius II and his brother Constans. There was some debate about who should take possession of the coins after Lawrence reported the discovery, but they eventually ended up in the hands of the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter. Lawrence was paid a finder's fee, and his coins are now known as the Seton Down Hoard. Please excuse the pun, but we're about to broach the topic of brooches. Specifically, we're talking about the Rogart brooch. This amazingly well-preserved brooch is thought to be Pictish in origin, and was probably made during the 8th century. It might not have looked out of place on the clothing of a Frankish woman 200 years earlier, as its design includes glass birdhead decorations. The Rogart brooch is so named because it was found in the village of Rogart, Scotland in 1868 during rock blasting ahead of the construction of the Sutherland Railway. It's made from a band of silver, decorated with interlacing patterns of gold, topped with a thick head. Several other brooches were discovered at the same time as the Rogart brooch, but the one that's now on display at the National Museum of Scotland is easily the most impressive in the collection. The fact that they were all discovered together suggests that they were buried deliberately. Historians aren't sure whether they were buried as votive offerings, or whether the burial was merely the act of a woman trying to make sure that her jewelry collection didn't get stolen. In 1999, a small archaeological dig was carried out on farmland on the Swedish island of Gotland. Yes, the same one we talked about earlier. The dig was performed mostly for the benefit of a television documentary about archaeology. A few coins were found during the dig, and the TV crew went home happy with what they'd seen. A couple of archaeologists remained at the site because they were convinced there was more to discover. And they were right. They eventually unearthed the Spillings Hoard, the largest collection of Viking silver ever found. In total, Jonas Strom and Kenneth Johnson found 14,295 Viking artifacts, most of which were coins, but there were also hundreds of bronze armlets and arm rings. A surprising number of the coins are Islamic dirhams minted hundreds of years ago, and seemingly buried on purpose beneath an outhouse that stood on the land during the 9th century. One item commands more attention than all the others, and that's the so-called Moses coin. Minted in the Khazar kingdom during the 800s, the inscription on the coin is dedicated to Moses, rather than Mohammed. That appears to confirm an ancient legend that the rulers of Khazar converted to Judaism. Do you remember watching the movie Titanic when the ship started to sink and the band carried on playing? That wasn't something the writers of the film made up. It really happened. One of the musicians was Wallace Hartley, who lost his life when the ship sank in April 1912. When his body was recovered two weeks later, his precious violin was still strapped to it. That violin found its way to auction in 2013 and sold for an incredible $1.7 million. The story of the violin after 1912 is remarkable. Wallace's sister initially had it sent home to her in England, where she kept it until she passed away in 1939. In her will, she left it to the Salvation Army. Nobody's quite sure what the Salvation Army did with it, but it ended up in a music teacher's attic by 2006. The music teacher thought nothing of it, apart from the fact that it was an old violin, but her son took it to have it valued. The valuer thought they knew what they were looking at immediately, but having the find verified and authenticated was a process that took seven years. When the music teacher sold it, she was told to expect a sale price of $100,000, when it went on to make 17 times that amount, 
she immediately retired from her job. The Spanish galleon ship Nuestra Senora de Atoca was supposed to be a reliable trading vessel during the 17th century, but it proved to be anything but. She needed two sets of repairs performed before she was even able to depart Cuba on her first ever voyage in 1620, and she didn't survive for very long. She made it to her native Spain and set off on a return trip to Colombia and back. She got to Colombia but never completed the return leg. Having made the ill-advised decision to sail past the coast of Florida during the hurricane season in 1622, she hit a squall and sank, taking her treasures with her. It wasn't until 1985 that she was found again by Mel Fisher, and all her treasures were still on board. Now, some of those treasures have been given up for auction, including the beautiful Atoka Emerald, which prestigious auction house Sotheby's estimates to have a value of around a quarter of a million dollars on its own. That's just one of the dozens of precious items that came out of the water, including a beautiful golden emerald ring with a rectangular cut stone that was found in 2011, and a single gold coin worth $100,000. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.